Good afternoon and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you, whether you're joining us here in the theater or joining us on our YouTube station. Before we hear from Stuart Eisenstadt about his new book, President Carter, The White House Years, I'd like to let you know about two other programs coming up in this theater this week. Uh, tomorrow at noon, Medal of Honor recipient Benny Adkins will be here to tell the story behind his new book, A Tiger Among Us, A Story of Valor in Vietnam's Ah Shaw Valley. While in Vietnam in 1966, Sergeant Adkins and 16 other Green Berets outfought and outmaneuvered their enemies along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and a remarkable number of them lived to tell it. A book signing follows that program, and on Friday, July 20th at noon, we will present a selection of archival films from the motion picture holdings of the National Archives. This will be the third program in our film series relating to our current special exhibit, Remembering Vietnam. Check out our website or sign up at the table outside the theater to get email updates, and you'll find more information about other National Archives programs and activities. And another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities and there are applications for membership in the lobby as well as at uh, the archives website, uh, foundation website, archivesfoundation.org. The National Archives is deeply entwined with presidential history, the presidential libraries that we operate, one for every president since Herbert Hoover, bring together the documents and artifacts of a president and his administration and family and make them available to the public for study and discussion. The Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Museum in Atlanta, Georgia, documents his life and public service through personal papers and records created during his administration. Today, we are fortunate to hear from someone who has a first -hand, was a first-hand witness to history documented in the library, President Carter's Chief White House Domestic Policy Advisor, Stuart Eisenstadt. Reviews for President Carter the White House years have been extraordinarily positive. In the Washington Post, Julian Zeltzer called it a fascinating new history and a comprehensive and persuasive account of Carter's presidency that stands far above the familiar confessional and reveal all accounts by former White House officials we are accustomed to reading. In the New York Times reviewer Peter Baker declared that until now there has never been a satisfying full-length his history of Carter's presidency, and Eisenstadt has produced a thoughtful, measured, and compelling account. Before he joined President Carter's staff, Stuart Eisenstadt served as a member of Lyndon Johnson's White House staff. In later years, President Bill Clinton appointed him as ambassador to the European Union, Under Secretary of Commerce, Under Secretary of State, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, and Special Representative of the President on Holocaust-era issues. In the Obama administration, he was special representative of the Secretary of State on Holocaust issues. He's also the author of Imperfect Justice and the Future of the Jews. A cum laude Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of North Carolina and Harvard Law School, he's now a leading international lawyer at Covington and Burlington here in Washington, D.C. Please welcome Stuart Eisenstadt. Thank you very much, uh, David, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I have a special connection to the National Archives, uh, first because I've known uh, and had the privilege of knowing uh, David for many years, and he's been a great National Archive uh, leader. Uh, Doug Swanson has done a terrific job of organizing these uh, weekly programs. But more personally, it's because I literally could not have completed my book which has been the product of almost 40 years of work on and off, without the archives. Uh, the National Archives, particularly the uh, Jimmy Carter Presidential National Archives in Atlanta, afforded me access to memoranda, to declassified materials that made it possible for me to complete uh, the, the work. Also, I've, as I'll mention, all of my notes that I've taken from this administration are in the National Archives and are accessible. And last, some of you may have noticed coming in the David Rubenstein Gallery where 
the Magna Carta is lodged. And David was my deputy in both the campaign in 76 and in, in the White House. And so we share a mutual admiration for the National Archives, whose slogan uh, and motto, the past is prologue, is indeed the case. And I hope in my presentation today, you'll think about the lessons uh, from our administration that are pertinent to today. Jimmy Carter's political idol was Harry Truman. And he placed his famous slogan, the buck stops here, on his Oval Office desk. Both presidents, Truman and Carter, left the White House highly unpopular. Truman is remembered today much more for his achievements than for his failures. And I'm hopeful that my book will have a similar impact on reassessing Jimmy Carter as president, not just as an admired former president. He's a president who respected his office, the institutions of the executive branch, the Justice Department, the FBI, built our alliances and strengthened them, believing they fostered US national security. And I believe that he is the most underappreciated president we've had in the modern era. Indeed, I think the most accomplished one-term president we've had in modern American history. Two independent surveys indicate that Congress passed almost 70% of all of our legislation, just under the percentage of the legendary Lyndon Johnson, the master of Congress, uh, for whom I served uh, as a junior aide in the 1960s. Walter Mondale, his vice president, summed it up very clearly. We told the truth. We obeyed the law, and we kept the peace. The rap on the Carter presidency is summed up by what I call the four I's, inflation, Iran, inexperience by the president and the so-called Georgia mafia that he brought into the White House, and inter-party warfare within the Democratic Party, particularly with the liberal wing of the party headed by Ted Kennedy. And in my book, I do not gloss over these. I don't try to whitewash the problems. They were very real. And I deal with them in a very candid and frontal way. But those problems have totally obscured the many successes which I saw at his first hand and at his hand in the Oval Office. And so what I wanted to do before it was too late, before all eyewitnesses had gone, before history's verdict was indelibly sealed as a failed president to give a complete view of this presidency, the achievements as well as the mistakes. And by the way, mistakes that I shared in as well. The credibility of the book is based in significant part on the fact that since college and then into law school and into the White House, I've been an inveterate note taker. I take verbatim notes of what teachers say, and I took verbatim notes of what everyone said in every meeting and every phone call. 5,000 plus pages of notes, which were augmented by over 350 interviews, five with President Carter alone. And I took interviews of everyone in the administration and everyone outside the administration who shaped the administration and that decade. Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals, detractors and supporters. And those were augmented again by what the National Archives were able to provide in terms of uh, records, books and manuscripts. Let me take you back then, because the past is prologue, to the 1970s. It was a decade of epic change in which the post-World War II consensus had begun to tear apart and unravel under the pressures of our first defeat in Vietnam. And David mentioned a war hero who's going to be speaking here tomorrow. Urban violence and a decade of slow growth and very high inflation, given the sort of ugly name of stagflation by economists. Simultaneous high unemployment and high inflation. 
It was a decade which saw the beginning of a whole range of new movements. The consumer movement, the environmental movement, the black power movement, the pro-life movement, and the women's rights movement, all occurring, by the way, right after Roe v. Wade, which is very much an issue today with the Supreme Court. It was also a decade which saw the ascendancy of a new political force, a major political force, which is with us today, and that is the conservative evangelical movement, initially led by Reverend Falwell, who contended that the most religious of presidents, Jimmy Carter, was not a real Baptist and harbored homosexuals on his staff, which was certainly not the case. And that coalition was put together by Ronald Reagan in 1980 in defeating us, by tethering the evangelical movement to Richard Nixon's so-called silent majority of angry white collar and blue collar workers. And that coalition is very much at the center of President Trump's coalition today as it was Ronald Reagan's in 1980. Abroad, the 1970s were also a period of epic change. The Soviet Union was at the apex of its power and influence with huge military buildups at land, at sea, and in the air. It's supported through Cuban proxy troops, revolutions in the Horn of Africa, and Euro-communist movements throughout Western Europe, particularly in Italy. It was also a decade which saw the rise of a new political force beginning to enter the world agenda, and that is the People's Republic of China. More on that later. It was a decade in which a Polish-born Pope, Pope John Paul II, together with President Carter, with a human rights campaign I'll discuss shortly, gave hope to the nascent democratic forces behind the Iron Curtain. And yes, it was a decade which saw the first radical Islamic revolution in Iran with which we had to live and every president has had to live very imperfectly. Let's look at some of the accomplishments that the president made on the domestic side. And you'll note both in my description of these and many in the foreign policy side, something badly missing today, bipartisanship. We would not have been able to get many of the things done that we accomplished and that I'll discuss without support from Republican as well as Democratic leaders. We not only had a weekly morning lunch with Democratic leaders in the Senate and House to go over our legislative agenda, but we had regular meetings with the Republican leadership to give them a sense of being invested in the success of the administration. Let me start with energy. The energy security we enjoy today, the reduced dependence on OPEC oil, is based on the foundation of three major energy bills that we passed in our four-year period which ended regulations on the price of natural gas and crude oil, therefore encouraging U.S. producers to produce more, and boy, they have done so. He put conservation at the center of our energy picture through the first fuel efficiency standards for cars and insulation standards. And he inaugurated the era of clean alternative energy, wind power, geothermal, and in particular solar, where now 10% of our new electricity comes from, and symbolically put a solar panel on the White House uh, roof, which unfortunately was taken down by Ronald Reagan, but not able to take down the power of the solar movement. And he concluded the bloody battle over the first energy bill after 18 months of struggle, appropriately in the war room of the White House, where President Roosevelt charted the course of World War II, and we often felt that the energy battle was a war as well. And we did it in that war room with two conservative Republican senators and two liberal Democratic members of the House. Again, something one would not see, unfortunately, today. In addition, 
Jimmy Carter was a great consumer champion. He appointed consumer advocates to the agencies which regulate our industries, not as today consumer stalwarts who come from those industries or who have lobbied on their behalf. And he augmented the mandate he gave them to create more competition by major legislation deregulating by law, by congressional act, railroads and trucks, and in particular, airlines. He democratized airline travel. New airlines could not get into the market under the regulated system. And the Southwests and the JetBlues, and for that matter, the UPS and FedEx Air Cargos, could not exist to the extent they did today had we not done so. Now, you may say, well, I'm not sure about deregulation when I'm sitting in the middle seat of an economy class and everybody's squeezed. But the fact is that we really opened up air travel to the middle class. And we didn't stop there. We began deregulating the communications industry and inaugurated the whole era of cable TV, which could not have existed without our deregulation. And for those of you who love your local craft beers, we also ended the prohibition era regulations, which prevented the flow of local craft beers. So every time you have one, you can make a toast to Jimmy Carter. In addition, he was, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of many experts, the greatest environmental president since Theodore Roosevelt created the National Park System. We took on very costly, environmentally damaging dams and water projects, but most pertinent, we literally doubled the size of the entire National Park System. Double the size through the Alaska Lands Bill, over the fierce opposition of the Alaska de delegation, which want, wanted the whole state open for oil and gas exploration. And he did so in sort of typically detailed Carter-esque fashion by putting a giant map of Alaska on the rug of the Oval Office, getting down on his hands and knees with Senator Stevens, a conservative Republican senator, and pointing out every mountain range, every river, what would be available for development, what would be protected by the National Park, and Senator Stevens told us afterward he was amazed that the president knew his state better than he did after having represented it for 25 years. We won the 1976 election against President Ford significantly because of the revulsion against Watergate and all the Watergate scandals and everything that that meant. And the slogan, I'll never lie to you, I'll give a transparent, honest government, really helped propel him into the White House. But it was not just rhetoric. We passed laws that are as pertinent today as they were then. In fact, one may argue even more so. So let me give you a few examples and then a few humorous anecdotes. The 1978 Ethics Act, which is very much in force today, requires senior officials going into government to disclose their assets, their family holdings, their connections to avoid conflicts of interest. It limits at that time, $25, the amount of gifts you could get in office, like free lunches, for example. And it restricted your ability to lobby, after you left government, the agencies that you served in. I'll come back to this in a minute. We appointed, through law, inspectors general to root out fraud, waste, and abuse in every agency. You cannot pick up the Washington Post in any week without reading an attorney general, uh, inspector general's report, most recently and most celebrated Michael Horowitz in the Justice Department about the whole uh, Russia investigation and Hillary Clinton and, and the like. In addition, we appointed the Office of Special Counsel. Sound familiar? The Office of Special Counsel started in the Carter administration as part of the post-Watergate reaction. We reformed the civil service system to give protection against political pressures. We created the Foreign uh, Corrupt Practices Act, which barred US companies from paying bribes to get foreign uh, contracts, and created the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which in effect restricted dirty tricks by the CIA from the Watergate era. All of this was done in addition to 
creating independent panels, non-political panels, from which President Carter chose his district court judges. Now, to go back to a couple of anecdotes, because I got caught up in the gift limit. So there was a profile done of me early in the administration saying that I had a great love for the little Tootsie Rolls that we still can get for one cent apiece. And the Tootsie Roll company saw this and they sent me to the West Wing, my West Wing office, a giant box of Tootsie Rolls. And I thought I was going to be dead for life to my young kids, bringing home a lifetime supply, only to have the legal counsel say, we're not going to count every one of these darn Tootsie Rolls, but we think it may be worth more than $25. So I had to send them back with a letter saying, you know, we've got new ethical standards and so forth. Well, story was not closed, unfortunately, because a year or so later, Another business magazine did a profile of the Tootsie Roll Company, and the CEO said, Eisenstadt tried to have it both ways. He sounded high and mighty about all the new ethics and so forth. We opened the box. It was empty. So we're still trying to find the Secret Service agent who stole my Tootsie Rolls. More seriously, remarkably, the first target of the new special counsel law we created was none other than President Carter's own chief of staff, Hamilton Jordan who was falsely accused by Roy Cohn, who was sort of a notorious hatchet man for Senator McCarthy, of snorting cocaine at Studio 54 in New York. Totally false, but a million dollars later, uh, through legal fees, he had to prove it. It was very diversionary. But the most important point I want to make about that is not once during that investigation of his own chief of staff did the president try to denigrate interfere with or demean that investigation. And I'll let you make your own contrast with what's happening today. Here was a Southern president that appointed more women and minorities to senior administration positions and judgeships than all 38 presidents before him put together. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's quoted in my book, and if you saw her documentary, RBG, she says, I wouldn't have been on the Supreme Court had President Carter not opened the judiciary to women. We supported affirmative action, uh, much in contest today. We saved New York City and Chrysler from bankruptcy. Uh, all of these things were done in addition to creating the Department of Education to put education front and center in the agenda. He and his Vice President Walter Mondale literally created the modern vice presidency. The one that exists today from Dick Cheney under Bush to Biden under Obama and to Mike Pence under President uh, Trump. It was an afterthought in the Constitution, David, as you know, a constitutional afterthought, and it was a position of derision. He and Mondale made something of it, made it a real partner with the president. After we won the 76 election during the so-called transition period before the inauguration. Mondale, having served two terms in the Senate, wanted to become something more than an afterthought. And he gave Carter a list of 10 requests to become a real partner, like, for example, access to all documents, classified or not, the ability to go to any meeting that he wanted to go to, one-on-one -on -one lunches in the Oval Office, just the two of them. Carter checked every one of them. You can see the memo in the National Archives with his check mark and J.C. beside it. And he added one that didn't exist on that list, and that was moving him from the executive office building across old executive office uh, uh, alleyway into the West Wing. And those of you who know anything about real estate, it's the same in politics, location, location, location. It's curious. He was now steps away from the Oval Office. He almost went a step too far because he was so emboldened by his new office, he got his own counsel to look at the original architectural plan for the West Wing when Theodore Roosevelt built it and found that, lo and behold, there was a private bathroom in that uh, office that didn't exist now. What happened to it? He thought about, well, I'm the vice president, I should have one. Well, what happened to it is during the Nixon era, uh, Henry Kissinger expropriated that into his National Security Advisor's office. Mondale wisely decided not to get into an argument with our National Security Advisor over a bathroom, and he did just fine without it. 
But one of the things that is unique, and it's one of the surprising descriptions and possibly in the question period we can get to it, is even though he was a full partner, I'm the only aide he told at a critical point in the administration that he came within a hair's breadth of actually being the first president to resign his office. Inflation was in many ways our Achilles heel. We inherited high inflation from Nixon and Ford, and it got worse in our administration, in part because of the Iran revolution and the cutoff of Iranian oil, which doubled the price of oil. But we simply couldn't come to terms with the ferocity of the inflation forces. And here's what Carter did. He told us going into a re-election year that he had tried everything, two anti-inflation czars, five anti-inflation speeches, voluntary wage and price guidelines with sanctions, tight budgets, cutting domestic programs, which uh, angered the liberal wing of the party. Nothing worked. And he said, I'm ready to take the toughest medicine I can deliver. I'm going to appoint Paul Volcker to be the chairman of the Federal Reserve. And in a celebrated meeting that I described in my book, Volcker was explicit about what he was going to do. It's no secret. I'm going to tighten the money supply. I'm going to raise interest rates. It's going to cause higher unemployment. In effect, I'm going to squeeze inflation out of the system the hard way. And he did. And not once during the reelection campaign, and Volcker credits him for this, did he, Carter, ever complain about the double-digit inflation uh, and interest rates which, which came. He took it as the medicine was necessary because he said to us, I would rather lose the election than have my legacy be permanent high inflation. Unfortunately, inflation did come down, and it came down quite dramatically, but not until the first year of the Reagan administration, not in time for our own reelection. And this, in many ways, is emblematic of the Carter presidency, doing things whose rewards became obvious only years later. In foreign policy, his accomplishments were equally dramatic. Let's start with what I think was the greatest act of presidential diplomacy in American history, literally in American history, namely the Camp David Accords and the Egypt-Israel Peace Agreement. For 13 agonizing days and nights, through 20 separate draft agreements that he personally drafted, through negotiating separately with President Anwar Sadat of Egypt and Prime Minister Menachem Begin of Israel, because they were like two scorpions in a bottle, they never negotiated together except the first day, he achieved something that was historic and then added two personal touches. The first was on the first Sunday of those 13 days, he took them to nearby Gettysburg Battlefield to dramatize and underscore that five wars between Egypt and Israel were enough. It was time for peace. But then on the 13th and last day, when we were close but not quite there, Prime Minister Begin said, Mr. President, I'm not bluffing. I cannot make any more concessions. I'm going home. I have an El Al plane waiting for me at Andrews Air Force Base. I want to get out of here. And the president, recognizing what a disaster that would be for the region, it would undercut Sadat's historic trip to Jerusalem, potentially cause the whole region to go up in flames, along with his own administration, knowing and pouring over intelligence documents before he came in about Begin and Sadat, what made them tick, where were their red lines, he took eight photographs for each one of Begin's eight grandchildren, knowing that Begin had a great love for his grandchildren, personally inscribed their names and wishes for peace with pictures of himself, Begin, and Sadat at Camp David, walked over to Begin's cabin, handed him the pictures, and then saw Begin sub-vocalize each of their names with his lips quivering, tears in his eyes, and Begin put his ba ba bags down and said, Mr. President, I'll make one last try. And the rest is history. Forty years later, never once has there been a violation of that treaty, and now they're allies in fighting radical uh, Islamic terrorism. He was also the first president to put human rights 
at the center of his foreign policy. And this was not sort of some dewy-eyed notion. I mean, yes, it was to him the sort of flip side abroad of civil rights abroad, but this was done in a time of the Cold War when we were competing with the Soviet Union for the hearts and minds of people around the world. And he applied it in two very different ways. First, to the military dictators and autocrats in Latin America, who were, by the way, pro-American and anti-communist, but who had horrible human rights records, thousands of political prisoners, non-communist political prisoners. We cut their arms. We got thousands of political prisoners released, and we gave an impetus to the democratic movement in Latin America that flourished during the 1980s and the Reagan uh, era. And we married that to what was the toughest political battle we fought with the Senate, the Panama Canal Treaty, to create a new era of US-Latin American relations which persists to today. An interesting story about the Panama Canal it was a widely unpopular treaty. Americans thought, what are we doing giving back our treaty to Panama? Well, it really wasn't our treaty, but people thought so. And getting two-thirds of the Senate to agree was hand-to-hand -hand combat. There were two heroes. One, the Republican minority leader, Howard Baker, from Tennessee, small in physical stature, but in my opinion, a giant of a man knowing that it would lose him the opportunity to be a future Republican nominee for president, but doing what he thought was the right thing. And the other, even more improbable, was a Republican senator from California named Hayakawa, who had coined the famous phrase, the canal is ours, we stole it fair and square. <laughs> Seemingly an improbable supporter, and yet Mondale worked on him, had known him from the Senate, and put him on the phone with Carter, and we needed every vote we could get. And the president said, Senator, what can I do to get you to support this treaty? One thing, Mr. President, doesn't have anything to do with the treaty. I want to meet with you every two weeks to share my wisdom on foreign and domestic policy. And the president said, every two weeks? Senator, I wouldn't want to limit you to two weeks. <laughs> Flattered, he voted for it. Carter never saw him again. <laughs> we also applied human rights to the Soviet Union, to what I call their soft underbelly their autocratic system to appeal to people around the world. We reached out to the democratic movement headed by a Nobel Prize winner in the Soviet Union named Andrei Sakharov and to the Soviet Jewish movement, double Jewish immigration and according to his own book, Save the Life of then Anatoly, now Natan Sharansky, who was the leader of that movement, by saying in the midst of his trial in the Soviet Union that in fact he was falsely charged as being a US spy, he was not. And we added to that soft power against the Soviet Union, hard power. Now I give Ronald Reagan all the credit that he deserves for the military buildup, which led to the unraveling of the Soviet Union, but we began that military buildup. It was on our foundation that Reagan built. We increased defense spending by 3% we got NATO to do the same. All the major weapon systems, the stealth bomber, and you can see one at the Air and Space Museum out in Dulles, the intermediate nuclear forces, new cruise missiles, all of these things were done during and green-lighted during our administration. And after the Afghan invasion on Christmas 1979 by the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, and there's never a day off in the White House, Christmas Day, 1979, Soviet troops march into Afghanistan, depose the president, and put a pro-Soviet leader in. This was Carter's, I think, best hour in foreign policy, even his conservative critics admit. We, for example, embargoed grain to the Soviet Union three weeks before the Iowa primaries. We boycotted the Mo Moscow Olympics, remembering the 36 Olympics in Berlin with Hitler. We put all sorts of economic sanctions on. And we promulgated something called the Carter Doctrine, saying to the Soviet Union, if you go any further in 
the Persian Gulf, we will uh, react with military force. And it worked. With China, I mentioned China. Again, Kissinger and Nixon deserve all the credit for reaching out to China. It was a historic activity, the Shanghai communique. But they did not restore diplomatic relations. They said there's a one China policy, but they didn't say which of the Chinas, Taiwan or the mainland. And that was because the Taiwan lobby was a major force opposed to severing relations with Taiwan and recognizing the communists in Beijing. In the Republican Party, we took that on in the Taiwan Relations Act, restored a new relationship, and restored diplomatic relations with China. And I was in the cabinet room for a historic meeting with Deng Xiaoping, all four foot 11 of them. I remember seeing him and saying, how can this little guy control a billion Chinese? And in the cabinet room, he thanks the president for this historic opening, restoring diplomatic relations. And then he says, and this may sound familiar today with our trade tensions, what I really want, Mr. President, now is I want the lowest tariff levels on Chinese goods that we send to you that you give to your most favored trading nations. And he said, I know the law, something called Jackson Vanik, which prevents that happening to any country that restricts immigration. And Deng Xiaoping said, look, this was not applied with China in mind. It was against the Soviet Union, which restricted immigration. We don't restrict immigration. And he took a little White House notepad and a pencil, pushed it over to the president, and said, now you write on this notepad the number of Chinese you would like us to send you each year, a million, 10 million? <laughs> and the president laughed and said, I'll tell you what, we'll make a deal right here. I'll take 10 million Chinese a year if you'll take 10,000 American journalists. <laughs> Neither had to fulfill that commitment. Now, more seriously, our really coup de grace, and I think what undid the president more than anything else was Iran. For 444 humiliating days, a radical Ayatollah outfoxed the United States and the administration, holding our hostages against every norm and rule of international law in our own embassy, which is our sovereign territory. It was absolute humiliation, and Carter's polls went down as he tried and tried to find a solution. Now, I am extremely candid in the book about our mistakes, and they were plentiful, and I'll briefly summarize them. One that I think would be unfair to criticize Carter for is the revolution itself and the exile of the Shah of Iran, any more than one should blame Dwight Eisenhower for the Castro Revolution 90 miles from our shore. But having said that, we made major mistakes. Mistake number one, the CIA had put the Shah of Iran back on his throne as a young man in 1953, overturning a popularly elected prime minister. And every president after that, six presidents, had made the Shah the centerpiece of our Middle East strategy. Tens of billions of dollars of your taxpayers' money and mine on the most sophisticated weapons. And yet, the CIA did not realize that the Shah's domestic support had evaporated. It was based on quicksand. Even more remarkably, they didn't realize that for five years he had secretly been given treatments for incurable cancer. They didn't realize that Ayatollah Khomeini, in exile now outside of Paris, when he was sending these incendiary inflammatory cassettes back to stir up an Islamic revolution, we knew he was sending them, but didn't realize the impact it was having in fomenting a revolution. Really inexcusable. I think the worst intelligence failure in American history perhaps only equal by, and I would say even more so than the absence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq in terms of its long-term implications. Then another mistake was what to do with the hostages once they're taken. What does the President of the United States do to get them out? I recommended, and our National Security Advisor, Spik Brzezinski, recommended immediate military action, not bombing, 
But mining or blockading the harbors outside of Iran, a place called Karg Island, where 60% of all their oil imports came out of, to choke their economy, to show determination. The president instead met with the hostage families and pledged that his number one priority was getting the hostages out safe and sound, which he did, but only after profound humiliation and a weakening of his status and I think the reputation of the country as well. And then another mistake was holding himself up in the White House to show he was working full time on the hostage release. And in fact, there were many agreements we reached to release them that the Ayatollah then vetoed. But what that did is made him a hostage in the White House. It gave the Iranians more leverage to show that he was spending all this time on, on the hostage crisis. And it emboldened the press to focus more and more attention on it. Ted Koppel's Nightland program, those of you old enough to remember Walter Cronkite, who was sort of the dean of reporting for CBS, would end every single program at night, his half hour program. Day 103, day 206, day 307 of the hostage crisis. It just drove it home time and time and time again. And then finally, what was actually a courageous effort at a rescue, the Desert One rescue effort, when it went up in flames, engulfed our whole administration. It's common wisdom and wrong to think that the reason it failed was because there were too few helicopters. No, the president added two more than the minimum the military wanted to conduct the daring rescue effort. The problem was there were four military services who had not adequately practiced together. There was no, as there is today, joint command. And so there was really a lack of organization. And when the rotor of one of those helicopters hit the C-130 cargo plane before the rescue effort ever really got started at the location we call Desert One, and eight U.S. servicemen died in flames. It really engulfed our whole administration as well. Now, having said that, let me give you two other perspectives, and then I'll take your questions. Jimmy Carter was not one to give up. We got thoroughly whipped in the election. We only won six states six states against Ronald Reagan in 1980. It was a debate gate issue, which I discuss in the book, but we lost and lost badly. The day after the election, when we were all as low as you can get, he called us all together and he said, we've got two and a half months left under the Constitution before I leave this office, and we're going to make them the most productive of any transition out. And he did. The Superfund bill, still in acted today to clean up chemical waste, that Alaska lands bill, the hostage agreement were all done in the post-election period. And one last thing which was done, again a show of bipartisanship, involved Stephen Breyer, now a Supreme Court judge, who was Senator Kennedy's top aide with whom we had negotiated airline deregulation. And Senator Kennedy called me up after our defeat and said, Stu, there's a vacancy on the First Circuit Court of Appeals in Boston. I'd like the president to name Stephen Breyer. You know, he was a Harvard Law School professor. He was my aide. You negotiated with him. I said, Senator, you don't have to convince me of that. But there are two insurmountable hurdles. Kennedy said, what are those? I said, well, the first is there's no love loss between Carter and you because you ran against him. You split the party. You never really reconciled afterward. He thinks you're one of the reasons he lost. He said, I know. That's why I'm asking you and not the president. <laughs> He said, what's the other insurmountable hurdle? I said, well, the other insurmountable hurdle is the Democrats also lost the Senate. Strom Thurmond is going to be the new chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Why in goodness name would he want to have a lifetime appointment going to a Democrat when Ronald Reagan will be in in just a few months? You take care of Carter, I'll take care of Thurmond. He says, okay, so I go in with my legal pad, one of the 103 I took notes on. I had 10 reasons why I should do it. I started by saying, don't ask who asked me to do this, but there's a vacancy on the First Circuit. We should appoint Steve Breyer. He'd be a great tribute to your administration. He winked and he said, I know who did it. We'll do it anyway. Yeah, I'll appoint him. So I called Kennedy back. I've done my part. How about yours? Strom is in the bag. I said, what do you mean Strom is in the bag? How did you have that happen? He said, well, Steve Breyer, as my aide, would meet every day for breakfast 
with Strom Thurmond's top aide, Emory Sneedon, to go over schedules and try to arrange as many non-controversial things as we can. He likes Steve. He thinks he's honest. He's going to support him. That would never happen today. It's really quite remarkable. Now, my book is not just about policy. It's about real people. And they could come out of a Shakespearean play. There's the tragic and the uplifting, the villainous and the heroes. And you'll see all of them portrayed. Tam doesn't permit going into very many of them. I'll just mention two, the two women in his life. Miss Lillian was a remarkable lady, his mother. As a young registered nurse in rural Georgia, she tended to African-American and white people when it was unheard of and often took chickens and crops for payment. At age 68, she volunteered for and went to India in the Peace Corps. She, was, she infused his sense of social justice as a young person. She was also a great defender of him during the campaign. So a reporter from New York came to interview her and wanted to puncture holes in her son's statement, I'll never lie to you. So she said to Miss Lillian, now you can't tell me as his mother that your son never lied. Come on. And Miss Lillian said, oh, he did. Of course, he told white lies all the time. What do you mean, Miss Lillian, by a white lie? Well, you know when I said how wonderful it was to have you from New York down in Plains, that was a white lie. The other woman in his life, now a wife of 72 years and counting, was Rosalind. And I saw in my own eyes how she blossomed from a campaign wife who literally was so shy she couldn't talk on the campaign trail when he ran for governor into a remarkably accomplished first lady. Only the second first lady, David, only the second after Eleanor Roosevelt to testify in Congress. She drafted with her own staff the community mental health bill, lobbied it through Congress. It was signed by in law. She was really a fantastic first, and that is Jimmy Carter himself. Here is someone who came from a gnat-infested hamlet of 500 people in southwest Georgia. He's the only one I saw who could stand and not swat the gnats away. And he goes all the way to the Oval Office through indefatigable campaigning, 100 days alone in Iowa before the caucuses, but also because he understood when the other Democratic president, presidential candidates, much better known, congressmen, senators, didn't understand what the mood of the country was, even Democratic voters, was not for a new burst of great society programs. It was for honesty, integrity, and government. And he understood that and tapped into that. That's why he won. And he created a very improbable coalition of conservative Southern whites who wanted one of their own to be in the White House for the first time since Reconstruction, African Americans, workers in the North, liberals, a very unstable coalition that could have survived in better economic times but came apart with the economic problems that we had. He had a very odd view of politics that was both his strength and his weakness. It was his strength because he believed, as a ferocious campaigner, that once you were elected to the White House, you parked politics at the Oval Office door, and you did what you thought was right, regardless of the political consequences. And that was a strength that allowed him to take on Panama and the Middle East and energy, which were highly unpopular, with a lot of political capital lost. But it was also his weakness. Because the President of the United States is not only commander-in-chief, he is politician-in-chief. He has to nurture his coalition. He has to nurture his base and bring them along in good times and in bad, something, by the way, the current President is very good at. And Carter was not. It simply wasn't his strength. And yet, again, his strength was that he wasn't a traditional politician. I think, therefore, that he was in many way, ways the first new Democrat. He was conservative on spending, on fiscal issues. He was progressive on race and poverty and social issues. He's a liberal internationalist, a free trader. 
And yes, he was properly criticized for excessive attention to detail. He would always ask us for more information, the appendices to decision memorandums. And we would sometimes literally get memos back with misspellings and punctuation marks not properly placed. But you know, that may be uh, a criticism for making decisions, doing too much reading. But over the years, I've begun to think maybe it's not such a bad way to govern after all. <laughs> there was a Jeremiah quality about him. His famous, the most famous and, and uh, admired philosopher was Reinhold Niebuhr, who said the sad duty of politics is to do justice in an imperfect world. And that was the Jimmy Carter, turn your thermosets down. We have to sacrifice to save energy. So in conclusion, I think my book will take you deeper into the White House than any other book. You'll be a fly on the wall, as some of the reviewers say. You'll understand how difficult it is to operate in that hot house atmosphere with pressures coming from every direction, with options that are often none of them good. So I'm not nominating Jimmy Carter for a place on Mount Rushmore. What I am suggesting is he belongs in the foothills of Mount Rushmore, along with many other presidents who made significant contributions to a better country and a more peaceful world. Thank you very much. So uh, I'll take some questions. Please use your microphones. And, and as we're doing so, I'll tell you one, again, humorous story that came from one of the characters in my book, Russell Long, who was uh, the popular senator from Louisiana through which uh, most of our legislation went as chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, but he was the son of the famous Huey Long, the populist governor of all the king's men, so-called kingfish, and he told me the following story. He said, when Papa came home one night to the governor's mansion in Baton Rouge, and I was a young lad holding on to Mama's apron strings, and Papa just collapsed in the foyer, and Mama was looking down at how this state of affairs could have happened to the governor of the great state of Louisiana, and Russell said, Papa, without pause, said, Mama, I've completed my prepared remarks. I'll now take questions from the floor. <laughs> so David has only given me water, but I'll take questions from the floor. OK, thank you. Th thank you very much for your talk. And I look forward to hearing more about the, uh, the history aspect of Jimmy Carter. I'd also like to talk about the, the after uh, experience for Jimmy Carter. When we think of him, we think of a lot of the humanitarian things he had gotten involved with. I'm curious from your perspective what you saw while he was president, his, humani his humanitarian aspects, and what, he, as a president, he can or cannot do in that position. And any, any well, that's a very good question. I mean, what he's done in the Carter Center, election monitoring all over the world, uh, curing two African diseases, guinea worm and, and uh, river blindness, uh, concern about nuclear proliferation, those were all matters that were central to his own administration, the SALT Treaty, for example, on arms control, uh, helping with uh, AID funds for poor villages in, in Africa, trying to get our own health insurance program passed, uh, being concerned with democracy around the world through his human rights program. So there's no surprise that what he carried into the Carter Center he carried from the administration. What is surprising is the success he's had, the model he's created. And that's terrific. Yes. Well, um, it's tough being president, and you talked about uh, no good choices. It's always struck me as, uh, I believe it's true, that the uh, high point of the Mariel boat lift and the uh, tragedy at Desert One are almost simultaneously occurring. And I just wondered if you had any yes, recollections I, so to I, share. I have in my concluding chapter a statement that no president confronted as many disasters in his last year as we did, and you've mentioned two of them. I've already talked about the Iran one, so let me tell you about the Mariel boat lift. It goes back to Castro again. So suddenly Castro decides, after a number of Cubans in his country take refuge in another Latin American uh, embassy, wanting to try to leave. And Castro, offended, then opens up his jails and allows unrestricted emigration, just like that. We're 90 miles from Florida, right? And so 
the Cuban American community, which had left Florida, hundreds of thousands, uh, uh, had left Cuba for Florida, hundreds of thousands, have boats, rowboats, and tugboats, and everything you can imagine, motorboats, to start ferrying people back. Well, apropos immigration today, what status did they have? Well, under law, they had the right to come to the United States as refugees from Cuba. But it was totally unrestricted. It was totally chaotic. We tried to have the Coast Guard interrupt those boats, but they would have capsized. So we ended up having to take over 100,000 Cubans and most, by the way, were not criminals, maybe two, three percent, but the notion was that they were, and we had no place to put them. So we ended up putting them in to military forts initially until they got assimilated. And one of the reasons that to this day there's a chill between President Clinton and President Carter is one of the places we put those uh, Muriel boat lift people was Fort Smith, Arkansas in Clinton's first term, the only election he ever lost was when he ran right afterward and he's always felt that, that was the reason. So it was a chaotic situation and it gave the sense of the lack of control. And that's a theme, you know, we can't control an Ayatollah and get our men back, men and women back. We can't control inflation. We can't control the boat lift. So it added to that sort of devastating session. But again, I can tell you I was in the middle of trying to find a solution. It was devilishly difficult to try to find a way to deal with this outpouring of people who were desperate to leave and people in Florida who were desperate to get them back into the United States. Yes? Yes, I've always been a great admirer of President Carter, but um, I've also been a great admirer of Oscar Romero and I've read several books about him, and it always pains me at the part where he writes the letter to Carter asking him to stop sending weapons to the El Salvador's uh, military, and two days later, he's assassinated, you know, at the altar saying mass, and it always pains me, and I wondered if you could comment on that. I've never been able to really find good information, you know, um, I guess you'd say uh, making Carter look better yes, so, on that. Thank you. So we, we basically, look, here was the big difference between the human rights policy at the centerpiece of foreign policy and the Nixon-Kissinger policy, which I think very much is the one used today. Under Nixon and Kissinger, it was called real politik. You didn't look at what was happening inside a country abroad. You only concerned yourself about whether their external conduct was pro-American or not. And these military dictatorships, Chile, El Salvador, Argentina, were pro-American anti-communists, but they were also extremely repressive. They repressed democratic movements, and so in cutting off arms to these countries, it was highly controversial, particularly back the uh, conservatives in Congress and outside of Congress. I think it was the right thing to do. It led to the democratic movement that we've now seen throughout Latin America, but it was very controversial because it was in effect saying, we appreciate the fact that you're anti-communist, but you're doing so in a way that's contrary to the best values of democracy. And again, you talk about the Carter Center, I mean, that's one of the things he's promoted, and we were promoting and did promote democracy in Latin America. I've got a quote from someone who actually was ambassador from Argentina to the European Union when I was U.S. ambassador during the Carter, uh, Clinton administration, Diego Guayar, he, he was a young lawyer, absolutely non-communist, seeking democracy and human rights. He had 23 bullets shot into his car because of his pro-democracy activities. And he said to me in my, one of the interviews, we wouldn't have democracy in Argentina or Latin America had Carter not taken the kind of tough action he did. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. I have to fully recommend your book to everybody in the audience. Uh, I, I'm a policy guy here in Washington, and I assigned it a summer reading for my junior policy analyst. It's a you know, fantastical read. Um, I want to give you a hypothetical, and if you can't answer this, feel free to pass. 
but assuming, and you've made some good parallels between today and the kind of malaise and the feeling of distrust in the early 1970s, but assuming Carter was running in, uh, in, in a couple years, how do you think he would, uh, a young Carter, face the uh, issues governing today, and how, what do you think would be the strategy to form a coalition of, of winning? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, I think, in an ironic way, many of the same themes of trying to have integrity and transparency uh, in government, of having a president who's, who's trusted to do the right thing, I think those would be some of the things he would do. I don't want to make this a political uh, uh, address, but I think that many of the same concerns that he addressed in 76 would be relevant today. Many of the ethics laws that were done uh, would be uh, important. And the importance of alliances. I mean, in the foreign policy section, I talk about how we work with NATO, how we work with the G7 democratic movements, how we work with the predecessor to the European Union. These are all countries that share our democratic values. We took on the Soviet Union. Um, and it's important that we do so with alliances. As powerful as the United States is, our European and Japanese allies add immeasurably to our ability to take on injustices in the world, whether it's from Russia or other countries uh, on the right or left. So I think that, that talking about that would also be, would be important. But you know, I'll tell you, there's one thing <coughs> that has to be said. I interviewed Jim Baker for the book. Jim Baker was the campaign manager for uh, Gerald Ford. He became, to his credit, to Reagan's credit, his chief of staff, then Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of State. And I interviewed Jim, and Jim is as good a politician and diplomat as you'll ever find. And he said, look, you guys beat us in 1976, yes, partly because of Watergate and Ford, but he said there's one rule in politics, and that is there are three things that are critical to a re-election. The economy, the economy, and the economy. So we had a bad economy. There's a very strong economy now. And I think the president, President Trump, has, you know, brag, will have bragging rights as long as that continues. How much is due to his policies is another issue. But people look at the bottom line. And so that's something that has to be taken into account. It's tough to run against a good economy. Okay, maybe one last question. No, okay. I'm sorry. Yes, you, you have. I can speak without a microphone. Um, you'll have to use a microphone. Have to use a microphone. Yes. Um, I I uh, recently ran across something that said that uh, the most highly regarded leaders in the world, there are three of them: Jimmy Carter, Fidel Castro and Mikhail Gorbachev. Now, you would never read that in any of our media, but uh, I thought I, maybe that should be mentioned. Of course, we've got, uh, uh, we've got Castro because he installed that free medical school in Havana, and most of the doctors in South America were trained there. Well, I would say in terms of Carter, uh, I can connect Carter and Gorbachev in the following way. In his book, Gorbachev said that one of the reasons he began the process of glasnost and what led to really the unraveling of the Soviet Union was because when intermediate nuclear weapons were put in Europe, uh, he realized he could not compete with the United States. And we, Reagan did that. We started it. We got the agreement from Schmidt and the Europeans to allow that to happen. So there, there's very much a, correction, a connection. Carter was and is at 93, a voracious reader, uh, and uh, he's written 22 books. And again, I think uh, as president, he was very serious about making decisions based on the best information we can, we can get. It was not done by instinct. It was done after careful deliberation by interagency processes. Uh, of course, there were no tweets in that day. There was no internet. But uh, I suspect he would not make many decisions uh, by, uh, by tweets if he could. So thank you very much again. I'll be glad to send books and thank you, David.
I'm just going to get my briefcase, and I guess I'll meet you uh, 